So let's come right to God's word. Again, we're going to be on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, and we'll, we're going to go through the Amplified Version because there's a lot of detailed information. I want to make sure that we, we get grounded in and, and, uh, and apprehend. So let's pray for God's help, the Holy Spirit's work now. Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I pray that your wisdom and your love would be unleashed in our minds and our hearts this morning. Father, I do lift up all those who are, who are ill, uh, some struggling spiritually, some physically. Lord, please meet those needs and help us not to grow weary in well-doing. Father, please. Um, September can be a month uh, for weariness for some people. I know that some people struggle with seasonal depression, Lord, and um, I pray for those who might be struggling in that area. Uh, so, Father, please bring life with his death. Bring hope with his hopelessness. Bless your word now as it goes out. Would you forgive us for our sins? Cleanse us, Lord, from the unrighteous way of living and thinking that we sometimes fall prey to. Deliver us from it, Lord. Cleanse us from it now. We want the free reign of your Holy Spirit in your house this morning. We do love you, Lord Jesus. Have your way now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it was uh, just the other day, I've been studying for this sermon throughout the week. I do a lot of reading during the week, and then it's Friday, Saturday that I start to put it to a pen on a, on a paper uh, so that I can work from an outline. And uh, in the midst of my study, I came across, um, whereas we're going to be talking about, and this is the sermon title, True Treasure. And it, we're going to be talking about God's warnings against living for material things, for, for material pleasures and, and, and building up bigger bonds in our lives as the Bible warns against. But I, I came across uh, this story of a nurse. Uh, her name is um, Bronnie Weir, and she was an Australian nurse who spent several years working in palliative care, that's end-of-life care, for patients in the last 12 weeks of their lives. She recorded their dying epiphanies in a blog called Inspiration of Chi, which gathered so much attention that she put her observations into a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And she that wouldn't, it probably won't surprise you to find out one of the top things on the list of, of regrets that people say on their, on their, on their um, deathbed is this. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. This came from every male patient that I nursed, she said. They missed their children's youth and their partner's companionship. Women also spoke of this regret, but as most of were from an older generation, many of the female patients had not been breadwinners. All of the men I nursed deeply regretted spending so much of their lives on the treadmill of a work existence. And, and certainly we are capable of that, uh, to live our lives for material things. I think it's very clear that it was in the mind and in the heart of the Pharisees. Remember, we, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and I keep recalling the verse that says, unless your righteousness exceeds, exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will no way see the kingdom of heaven. And so... What was Jesus saying when he said that? We talked about it last week, that the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes was deficient, seriously deficient. And so realizing that the scribes and the Pharisees were these, these very, very stringent law-keeping people, it, it leaves you in a state of bewilderment to say, like, these guys were so, so religiously good at law-keeping the law of God, that they even tied their mint. I mean, how, how, can I, how can I live up to the standard that God wants me to? Well, we're going to get the answer in the next few sermons in a very clear way, and it centers around this key verse, which we won't touch this week, likely in the next two weeks, from Matthew 6.33. The next section of the Sermon on the Mount centers around this, this admonition from Jesus. He said in Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. God first and then all those other things will be added unto you. But 
it's clear as we start to study uh, from this section of the scripture that God is clearly identifying a problem within believers' lives. He's not really talking to unbelievers because unbelievers have a God, and it's not God, Jehovah. It's the God of this world, which revolves around money and power and influence and selfish desires. The God of this world propels the world with this desire. You just need one more thing. And you see the regret in all these people that the nurse tended to, that they regretted working so hard. They were on that treadmill trying to earn one more dollar, get one more promotion, get, to get one more thing that they thought they needed. And that's a symptom of someone who is blind. They don't lack any spiritual perception of life and the purposes of God. When we pray, we, and we talked about the Lord's Prayer last week, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is that going to happen if you're living for you? If I wake up every day and I'm living for me, how is God's will, his will, and his purposes and his kingdom going to come on earth and as it is in heaven if I'm living for me selfishly? It's not. It's a total block to what God wants to do. And so I wanted to ask you guys the question this morning. What is the main focus of your life? What do you invest in most? What do you treasure most? We'll hear from Jesus that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So think about it. If, you, if your whole life centers around the financial investments you make, what's your focus going to be? It's going to be the stock market, right? You have investments, and so you're going to watch the stock market. That's going to be your focus every day, you know, because that's where your money is. You're very worried about it, and you put it in this place, and so you, you're going to worry about it. If your um, focus is real estate, well, you're going to watch the real estate market. You're going to be watching to see if the value of the, the properties went up or went down. That's going to be your constant focus. Um, let's say that you, your focus is building a business. Well, that's going to be your focus. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen this happen in people's lives where they have a business and it, it engulfs their whole life. It's, it, it consumes who they are. Um, I, I'm thankful to God. I do not take credit for it in any way, spiritual way, other than God protected me. But there was a time in my life when I started my own business that that was my life. Some of it was bent towards fear. I was always afraid I wouldn't have enough money, so I felt like I had to work extra hard to make sure I always had enough. And that necessarily isn't a bad thing. But there was a time in my life when my whole focus was getting the business to another level, buying another truck, hiring another man, looking at the bottom line, trying to make more money, have the, the bottom line of the company be higher and higher and higher, thinking that that was where I was going to find peace and, and life and, and contentment. But I never did. And I'm thankful that God, many, many years ago, helped me to prioritize my life and to put him first. And I never allowed my, my, my secular work to interfere in my spiritual work for God. And even today, don't you know it, as owning a plumbing and heating company, I get calls on Sunday morning. My water heat is gone. You know, what time can you be here? And I say, I can't. And they say, what do you mean? You know, you're a plumbing company. Don't you do emergency service? I said, I do, but not on Sundays. And, uh, well, if you don't come, I'm going to call somebody else. You've been my plumber for years. They get that, that, that temptation. And I say to them, I am very, very sorry, but I can come first thing Monday morning if you can wait. I've never seen anyone die from not having hot water for one day. And I can rest assured you won't die. Yes, the cold shower hurts. I get it. But uh, not the worst thing that can happen to you. So I've had that threat. And I've said to people, I'm sorry. I, I, even when I wasn't a pastor, I'd say to them, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't work on Sundays. Um, now, listen, I'm not ignorant. If somebody called me and said, there's water pouring through my, my ceiling, <laughs> I'll first try to educate them on how to shut the water main on. If they couldn't do that, I have gone out, walked into the house and said, seller, boom, I'll see you tomorrow. I have done that, but I didn't let it be more than that. Well, you're, not, you're here, why don't you just... Blah, blah. No, sorry. 
Um, this is considera consideration, and I, I consider God to be fine with this. I'm just being considerate. I'm not going to let your house be ruined because I have a principle. This isn't about a principle. It's about my heart and about caring for others. So I didn't want to let my good become evil. You know, you know what, I'm saying, what I'm saying? Oh, I can't come. I'm a Christian. I'm a holier than thou. I don't work. So I'm going to let your whole house be destroyed because I won't come and turn a handle for you. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that happen. But I'm so glad that God helped me to, to, to always put him first in this area of my life. But my business could have easily become, and it was for a little while, the center of my life. And um, so at the end of the day, I'm, I'm grateful that God did that work on my life and helped me to prioritize things. Because for a, a, a short time in my life, that was the focus of my life, and that's where my heart was. And thankfully, God didn't let that become. But the bottom line is, if, you're, if your investment, if you're investing in heaven is what we're going to learn this morning, that's where your heart will be also. And we'll talk about what it means to invest in heaven. But here's what, here's what Jesus gave um, the Pharisees and those listening on the Sermon on the Mount. This, this caution, which is to let, and we want this message this morning to, to at this moment, to help us reevaluate our own lives and in, in priorities and what we're investing in and what the main focus of our lives are. And so Jesus said this, do not store up for yourselves material treasures on earth. Why did he say that? Well, he gives us the explanation. When we, when we store up for ourselves material treasures on earth, ultimately moths and rust and just destroy it, and, and thieves come in and break, break in. He says, but you, and he's talking to believers now, but you store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers will be also. And that is a fact. Let me tell you something. That is a fact. If you're putting something else before God, and that's the core and the, and the heartbeat of your life, that is where your heart will be. That's where all your energy will go. That's where your thought life will be. And Jesus is cautioning us against doing that. I do believe he's contending with the Pharisee life. That the Pharisees, they were greedy. They used the people, God's people, who came to the temple as money makers. They cheated them. Because they had an eye towards evil in their hearts. And so... I want you to look at me, look with me in 1 Timothy 6, 17 this morning. This is what Paul, um, in his letter to Timothy, said this. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Now make, mistake, make no mistake about it. When, when the Bible says those who are rich, everyone in this room is rich, okay? <coughs> in comparison to the, the poverty of the world. So command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or prideful, or arrogant, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Why does God say that to us? Because anything that we're trusting in that's material, it's not forever. It's temporary. It doesn't last. I, there was a time in my life when I, I had a motorcycle, and uh, I, loved, I loved that motorcycle, and but they got to a point where I lost interest in it. So it just sat in the garage, and it just started to pit, and the chrome started to look terrible, and the value of the bike was going down because I wasn't taking care of it. I spent more time polishing it because I wasn't driving it, and the Bible's true. That thing had no value, really. It wasn't a treasure at all. It was a burden. And so thankfully, so thankfully, it's that we look, we look at, the word of God, and we can see that we shouldn't invest in things that pass away, but we should invest in what? Things that are eternal. And that's in, in the work of God, and that's in, in lives being saved. You know, the Bible tells us that God wants all, and when he says all, he means everyone in this world, all of his creation, to come to the knowledge of the truth. I believe that's the only reason why God doesn't come back today. It's because he wants one more soul. He has a plan he has a total number of those who he has called and chosen who will come into the kingdom of God, and that quota has not been met. But I, you can be rest assured 
when that number is reached, he will return. And the end of the, the world will follow as we know it. But God wants one more. And so it's important for us to realize that we don't have to try to gain things in this world and make them the obsession of our lives. The Bible teaches us over and over and over again that God gives us all things to enjoy. It's okay to have a nice car. It's okay to have a nice house. It's okay to have a savings or an investment or a retirement. It's okay to have those things as long as they don't have you. Do you understand what I'm saying? That you're not obsessed with that. It's money. Money is not the root of all evil, is it? It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money, the obsession of money. What does the, the average commercial today scream to you? You need this. You've got to have this. If you don't have this, you won't be happy. And what do we know that to be? It's a lie. Half of the things in our lives that we think we need, we don't need. That's a good prayer. Lord, don't give me what I want. Give me everything I need. And you'd be surprised what you really do need. At the end of your life, if I told you there was only one thing you could have, what would you say? I mean, millionaires never say, I, want, I wish I could have earned one more dollar. No, they'd say, can I have one more day? Can I have one more hour? Because life is precious. And those are the things of heaven. What's our promise as we believe in God and put him first? Eternal life. See, eternal life never ends. It doesn't rust, it doesn't corrupt. And we should want that for everyone that God created. And that's how we invest. That's how we, we store up treasures in heaven. Is by investing our lives in the work of God. And in Christian lives. Others coming to know Jesus. Look what it says in verse 22. This piece of scripture can be, in 22 and 23, it can be a very complex piece of scripture. And so, that is actually why I chose the Amplified Version because I, I think it's important that we understand what the Scripture is saying. This might be one of the most important Scriptures in the Bible. You've heard me say something like that in the past, but I really mean it, and you'll understand why in a moment. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear, spiritually perceptive, your whole body will be full of light, benefiting from God's precepts. But if your eye is bad, spiritually blind, your whole body will be full of darkness, devoid of God's precepts. So if the very light inside of you, your inner self, your heart, your conscience, is darkness, how great and terrible is that darkness? I'll give you an example of what the scripture is talking about. Our perception. If you have an eye filled with light. You're going to be a person that, I'll give you a hypothetical, you're sitting in your living room, you look out the window, you see a brand new car go by the window and pull into your neighbor's driveway. And if your heart and your eyes are filled with light, you're going to go to the window and you're going to look at that car and say, wow, I'm so happy for them. They've worked so hard their whole life. They've had that clunker forever. They finally got a new shiny car. Oh, God bless them, I hope. And we run over and we say to them, I'm so happy for you. What a blessing. No more, you know, you know how many times I had to come over and jump you and your car, your battery would, would die and how many tow trucks I've seen bring your car home. Finally, you got a new car. You work so, I'm so happy for you. You know, I hope, I hope this is a blessing from God for you. That's an eye that's filled with light. Now the eye filled with darkness. You're sitting on that same couch. You see the new car pulling. You look out and you look in the window and you look at that car and you went, hey, honey, the, uh, the Rich Joneses next door bought a new car. What do you think of that? Who do they think they are buying a new car? And by the way, why can't I, we have a new car? You know, God, how come I can't have a new car? You gave them a new car. You know, and you walk over to that neighbor and say, you got a new car, huh? Yeah? I heard these break down a lot. Yeah? What's the gas mileage? Yeah, that's what I thought. It's a lot of, you're going you're gonna to go broke on in this thing. You know what the repairs are on this car? Yeah, well, good luck. And go back next door. See, one perception was, came out of a heart that was good. 
and could see that this could potentially be a blessing. This is one example of, of what this verse can mean. There are others. But then there's this other evil heart, this blind heart, that just sees evil and thinks evil and looks at that same situation with greed in its, in its, in its intention, in its jealousy in its intention, and looks and says, huh, why do they get to have a new car? God, why don't you let me have a new car? How come they get a new car and I don't? I'm the one who goes to church. They never go to church. Every Sunday, you know, that, car will, that new car will never go to church. And you know what we're saying in that moment, and the evil is revealed, that if you're a good God, you'd give me more. And because you're not giving me more, you're a bad God. Do you see the accusation of what it can mean? And so, if you look at Genesis 13, I, I found an Old Testament example of how this scripture works. And I'll read through it very quickly. Genesis chapter 13, this is the story of Abram and uh, Lot as they came out of um, the, the Middle East. Uh, the, Abraham was called in Genesis 12 to go to a place that God would show him. And he took this huge step of faith. He took his family and he just followed the will of God of what God wanted them. And God was actually leading him to Canaan, uh, to this promise. And um, he took uh, Lot with him, his family member, and listen to what it, it says in verse 5. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. This represents the material things of life. They, they were wealthy. They had all these material things. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Ab Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelled in the land. So here's Abram with all of his flocks and herds. All of his, that was wealth back then. They didn't have bank accounts. This is how wealth was attained. It was by having all these cattle. And the more cattle you had and the more livestock you had, the richer you were. And Abram was a very wealthy man and also was Lot. And they both had so much that there was jealousy. It was kind of like, I'm, I'm of Lot's herd. You know, look at, look at us. Look at, look at what we got. Let's count them today. We've got uh, 10,000. How many have you got? And Abram's guys would count theirs and go, well, we have 10,001. <laughs> what, what do you think of that? You know, we just had an offspring come. Uh, one of our pregnant sheep just had, you know, two more. So we're up on one on you. And they, they, there was strife between them. But look what happens. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me in between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes. Now notice, notice, what, notice the generosity of Abraham. Abraham was the older one in the family, so he was entitled to the best. That's how it worked culturally in the family dynamic of the Israelites. He was entitled to... To the, to the best that the land offered. But he relinquished that right. And this is an important thing. That he deserved more. And he, he had every right to have more. But he forfeited his right. Out of love. For Lot. But look what Lot does. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan. That it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord. Like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. So Lot looked and he says, uh, let's see, what's the best? Let me find the water. There'll be plenty of lushness around there. And so he chooses all the land um, going towards Sodom, which was fertile. It was the best. What was he doing when he was doing that? He was being selfish. He was thinking of himself. You know, oh, my choice? Okay, I'm going to take the best. In taking the best land, what did he know? He was leaving Abram, who had been generous, the worst land. He was being very selfish. Now, what have been, what have, what have been the Christian thing to do? What have been the godly thing to do? What, have been, what would have been a person filled with an, a clear eye have done? Abraham had already done it. Lot's response should have been, no, 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 I'm not going to, 
I'm, I'm not going to let me just have all the good land. Let's find a way that both of us can have good. I'll take a little bit of the bad land and the good. You take a little bit of the, the bad and the good, and this way we'll both be blessed. But that's not what Lot did. Lot did the selfish thing. He held on and made a decision to, to take what was best. But look what happens. So Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. There's going to be a price for the choice that Lot had made, the selfish choice he had made with his evil eye, his evil heart. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now God's talking to Abram, I just want to, I want to show you something. You've sought me first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Watch the principle come to life. And so God says to, to Abram, after Lot had left, he said, Abram, do me a favor. Lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are. Look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. He's saying, Abram, you made the right choice. You made a choice to trust me. When you gave the choice to Lot, you were saying, God, I trust you that whatever he doesn't choose will become a blessing to me. No matter what Lot chooses, I know that if I put you first and be the loving brother that I need to be to him right now, because he's blind, he can't see, I know you'll bless me. And this is something so important when it comes time, when you look at your material wealth and you look at your material things, some people struggle so much in giving to God. I, Pastor, how can I give to God? I can't even pay my mortgage. I can't even make my car payment. I can't even feed my kids. And the principle does not bear out because God promises if we seek him first, all those things will be added unto you. That's not up for debate. That is not an experiment. That is a fact. You can trust God. I've lived the principle. And forget about me. I know many people who have lived the principle and they always have what they need. They have never gone, couldn't pay the mortgage, couldn't make the car payment, couldn't fill, fill. Now, now, bear in mind, we can't be ignorant. If Darren wants to go out and says, well, you know, let me test the principle. I'll go buy a Lamborghini. The payment's going to be about $10,000 a month. You know, well, God says, you know, he'll, he'll take care of it. No, that's with the wrong heart. But if I'm living a life that's putting the heaven and the things of heaven in front of everything else, you can be rest assured God is going to provide. That is a promise from God when he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. But look what happened. Abram, God says, look around. It's all yours. And look what it says in verse 16. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, think about that, it's probably impossible, then your descendants could be numbered. God was telling him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quadruple. Whatever. Your seed. Arise, walk in the land through this, its length and width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelled in Timbrinth, trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and he built an altar there to the Lord. Now remember, Lot made his choice, right? It was to go towards the plain, heading towards Sodom, and we know the story of, of Lot, don't we? He ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah, and what ultimately ended up happening to him. He lost all his family, his friends, even his wife was consumed by the fire. Uh, ultimately, she turned back and looked back towards Sodom. Wouldn't let go of the selfish desire for pleasure. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. So, what, uh, uh, what an example of having that clear eye, that, that spiritually perceptive eye. At that moment when when Lot makes, uh, Abram makes the decision that, okay, we can't dwell together. We're both, we're just, we're, we're, we're too plentiful. We need to separate. We need to have, you know, we don't want the, our, our people to fight o over our possessions. When he made that decision to split up, it was a clear spiritual heart that said, I don't want to be more blessed. I want to do a spiritual thing here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, condescend. I'm going to step back so that 
Lot can be blessed. And you know what Lot was supposed to be? You remember, you remember that the, uh, the Disney characters, um, um, Chip and Dale, right? I'm Chip, he's Dale. That was the song, right? And, and in, if you watched any of the segments throughout it, it was always like, they were always out, outdoing each other. No, no, you go. No, 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 I insist you go. No, 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 I, I truly, truly insist that you must go. They would never let one or the other be, to have less or more than the other. They always wanted the best for each other. And that was the right response that ex- a- Abram exhibited, but Lot didn't. Lot said, I can't do the loving, generous thing because he had an evil heart that couldn't see and perceive that goodness that should have came out of his life. He couldn't see it. He was blind to it. He was too obsessed with himself and having more. And we can be that way with God because there's a fear that we won't have enough. When God says, I'm enough, I heard a, I read it in a commentary commentary, uh, this week that God is not trying to raise cash He's trying to raise kids. Because at the end of the day, God doesn't need our money, right? God needs my money? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the creator of all things. He owns everything. Does he need my money? No, he doesn't. But God knows that I need to give. Because it's a test. It's a test every day when we choose to give to God of our finances and and of our time and of our heart. What do you care about more? What is the focus of your life? Is it money or is it me? I don't tell you this to make you feel bad this morning. It's a good question. It's a convicting question. But it's one to be analyzed. It's one to be addressed. And it's one to be answered. Is God's work less important than what your plans are and what you want to do? Or what I want? No. My business, whether it succeeds or not, is not more important than the kingdom of God and the work of God, souls being saved. I have prepared for many, many years that God would take my business away and would leave me with only his work. And I've prepared my heart for that. It's not happened yet. But God knows my heart. My plan is to do full-time ministry one day, and I pray soon. But I'm leaving that up to God. But look at this in verse 24, and we'll wrap up. You can take this next statement from God as a fact. No one can serve two masters. It's a fact. No one can serve two masters. If I stand before two kings, and these both are kings in my life, I'm, I'm a servant unto them, I can't serve both of them. One king would say, Darren, I want you to go to the east, and I want you to take up battle, and I want you to fight my enemies in the east. The other king would say, Darren, I have a job for you. I want you to go to the west, and I want you to fight my, my, my enemies in the west, and I want you to do that now. How can I serve both of them? Unless I could cut myself in half and half go that way and half go that way. I can't, can I? And so the Bible is true. You cannot serve two masters. For the Bible says, for either you will hate one and love the other, or you will devote to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and and mammon. That's money, possessions, fame, status, or whatever is valued more than the Lord. You may think you can. You may say, well, no, no, I can can coddle my business, and I I can coddle my investments, and and I'll, I'll still, you know, let God be my master. You're fooling yourself. I'm fooling myself when I think I can do that. Because you can't. You're going to end up loving one and hating the other. And I can't tell you how many times I see that spiritual principle come to life in people's. It, it, you see it. In the way that they, their attitude and how they attend church and how they involve themselves in spiritual life. It's like when it's convenient, they're around. When it's not convenient, well, I had to work or I had something else to do or whatever. And you find out what's the priority in their life. And it's not God. 
And this is a hard lesson to learn. It's, it's one that we must learn. Or it's one that you will run away from and reject and find the reason why I don't believe that. That's crap. I can have two masters. I can have both. I can have my cake and eat it too. The Bible says you can't. No one can serve two masters. So we have a choice to make as believers this morning. God is, is, is putting us in a position whether you're going to acknowledge it today or I'm going to acknowledge it today. Just so you know, I'm preaching to me too. You do have a choice to make. And you're either going to serve God and live for God. And that means you still have the house and you still have the car and you still have a savings, but you don't live for that. That's not the focus of your life. We can have all kinds of obsessions, all kinds of hobbies, and put them before God. But when we do that, we're despising the other, whether you know it or not. When you give God half-hearted in a half-hearted way, you're saying to him, you're not more important than this. I'm saying you're not more important than this other thing. My, my bank account, my, my career, my, my pursuit of, of position and, and fame, you're not more important than that. You are more important than that is what you're saying when you don't put God first. So we have a choice to make as believers. Who will we serve, God or material desires, money? Well, the defense is, well, I need money, Pastor. I need money. And I say to people, yes, you do, but you don't need it more than God. And you don't wait to the end of your life to figure that out. Because that billionaire on his deathbed wouldn't wish for another billion. He'd wish for one more day. And the only one who could give us one more day is who? God. But he gives us much more than that in eternal life. He gives us eternal life. When we leave this earth, we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. Amen? I came up with this. We know the love of money is the root of all evil, so the opposite is true. The love of God is the root of all good. The love of God is the root of all good, all righteous living. For the scripture is true. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Do you hear the instruction? Seek me first. Put me first. Trust me. But do you also hear the promise? And I'll take care of all those other things you're striving for. You don't need to put those things first. Put me first and I'll, put, I'll take care of those things. God's trying to cure us of a sickness. It's the sickness of self. It's the sickness of self-centeredness and self-focus and self-care. It's a two-fold step in, in Matthew 6, 33. God tells us our part, which is to seek him first, and then the blessing. God tells us his part. All those things will be added unto you. I will provide those things. You don't need to, to work so hard towards attaining these things that you think will fill you up and make you happy. They won't. It isn't a home. You know how many people I know that they think, I got to change my geography, then I'll be happy. So they, they, they put all their hope and ambition into, if I just had to live somewhere else, I'll move south. Then I'll be happy. Then I'll be full. And I have to give them the bad news. <laughs> I say to them, no, you won't. Because your sorrow and discontentment will travel with you because you're going. The depression will be down there. The lack of fulfillment will be down there. The emptiness will follow you. You won't be happy. I tell the story of when I was uh, in my late teens. I just gotten over a relationship. Girlfriend I was with for a, a long time broke up with me. I was, I was a sick love child. <laughs> Needless to say, I was heartbroken. And uh, in the midst of my deep depression and sorrow, I was driving up Route 1 North, and if, if you know the area, there used to be a place called Vizoni's, and they sold Corvettes. <laughs> so I said, oh, let me pull in here. And I walked down the showroom, and there's probably about 100 Corvettes lined up. And I started to feel a little more happy. So I pulled up to a red one and sat in it. The owner comes over. He says, uh, do you want to drive it home today? 
I said, yeah, I'd love to. I can't afford this guy. He goes, yes, you can. He says, I'm going to give you a loan. And he gave me a loan for the car. And I did drive home that day. And I went cruising like a typical Revere boy down Revere Beach. Oh, boy, T-tops off. Boy, was I smiling. And people were smiling at me. And after a few days, I went home. It was late at night. I got into bed, and I was empty. And I was sad, and I was crying, and I was miserable. Guess what? The car didn't do it. It didn't fix anything. I still was empty. And so I cried out to God that he would fill me. And you know what he did? He filled me. I woke up the next day, and all the depression was gone. And God let me keep the car, but it was no longer my source of joy. It was what God had did that night to protect me because I asked God to take my life that night because I was in so much pain. But he loved me too much that he didn't take my pain. He let it stay with me, and he gave me peace with it the next day. And that's the treasure. That's the true treasure. It's not the things of life, the material things. They will never make you filled. But it's God who will fill you. Would you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the power of your word, the warning, the loving warning, Lord, the chastening we feel in our hearts when we hear your scripture, Lord, that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. It's so true, Lord. Help us to treasure the things of eternity the precious life you've given us and the eternal life you've promised to us. Help us to want that treasure for others, Lord. Cure us, Lord, of thinking that the material things of the world are what we really need. We know, Lord, by experience that those things really won't make us happy. But there is a level of insecurity, this comforts, Lord, that we've gotten used to. Cure us, Lord, of those needs and those requirements for ourselves. Fill our flesh with spiritual fulfillment and recognize that you are what we need. Draw us further and further away from those material things and those obsessions that we would have clear eyes that can perceive and see the things of God. Lord, please, for each of us here today, I pray that this message is not one that we feel attacked by, but we feel loved by that we would take an inventory of our own lives and make the changes that we need to make and, and realize this truth that you taught me, that we can't outgive you. We can't. We love you today, Lord. Please be with all those who are ill. I do lift up our friend Chris, Lord, for, for recovery and healing, and anyone else, Lord, who's struggling right now in any, any kind of physical or emotional way. Heal them, Lord. I know they need you, as we all do. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday.